So how are you feeling after the weekend in Rotterdam? I'm good, really. It's the first um first weekend where I've done a double header race on the Saturday and the Sunday, and I actually ironically felt a bit better in the doubles race on the Sunday compared to the um singles on the Saturday. Did you? Yeah, it's a weird one from um like just everything felt a bit more open during the doubles race. I'm not sure if it was because it was cooler in the venue or if like sort of I got the travel out my legs on the Saturday, but yeah, I felt a lot stronger on the Sunday. All right. So so on Saturday you did the open, you won the open. Uh overall, what was your time? Fifty nine something? Um fifty nine thirty four, I believe it was. Okay. Nice. That's that's not a PB for you, is it? No, my um open PB is fifty fifty eight seventeen, I wanna say, okay. or fifty eight thirty. It's around it's around mid to low fifty eight. Right. Were you happy with how the race went? Um I was happy with how I felt during the race, but I think a combination of it being quite a busy course and then it was 25 degrees on Saturday in Rotterdam and there wasn't really any real ventilation or air conditioning in the um, arena. So it was, re- it was really hot and really humid. So the runs, I felt fine. I felt smooth. It was like the fastest running I've done in an individual race ever, I think. But the stations, when you stop moving, like the heat gets to you and I think that's what slowed me down. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting actually. When I was looking at the times, like I get a feel for if a venue's reasonably quick or not, just by seeing like some of the times when I'm looking, and it didn't it didn't feel like it was a particularly fast venue, especially on the Saturday. And then I noticed there was a couple of like age group world records and the mixed relay world record on the Sunday, but it certainly feels like the Saturday for whatever reason, whether it was the heat or the busyness or something like that, weren't overly fast. Um, especially compared to like Copenhagen, which I know you did a few weeks mm, ago, yeah. right? Did it feel different? Did that like if you compare those two venues, like from one that don't strike me as being particularly quick to one that did, was there obvious differences in those venues? Would you say? Um, well, the main difference really was uh, Rotterdam was a three lap course and Copenhagen was two laps. But other than that, there wasn't really many differences. Copenhagen was a lot wider, so if it was busy at the time when I did it, the pro doubles, it was quite quiet because it's late at night and the main waves have kind of gone, but you're able to sort of pick your own line. Whereas in Rotterdam, it was a lot of weaving and turning around people. So I think that was probably the, the main factor because um, in the men's open in Copenhagen, I think that was probably 20 odd times under the hour. Whereas in Rotterdam, I was the only one to go on an hour and that was, only just so i think there was definitely a uh, quite a big difference in the courses there yeah yeah um so let's talk about obviously you're a talented athlete you're only 22 right yeah 22 yeah all right so where uh tell me about your sporting background what what were you doing when i want to say when you were a kid but you still feel like a kid to me so yeah. <laughs> when you were much younger what, what were you doing well i've had um but how old I am, I've had quite a long sporting career, as you could call it. So from the age of about seven onwards, I was playing uh, football quite regularly. And I got scouted by Reading as a goalkeeper. And I made it into their academy team at the age of eight or nine, I think. And I spent a couple of years um, within the academy as a goalkeeper. And I loved it. Like I was playing football three or four times a week at the age of 11, which is, well, not 11, eight or nine, um, which was quite a lot for my uh, parents, especially driving me to and from training. But that was kind of the first bit of proper sporting, well, proper like serious sporting stuff I'd really got into. And then from that, I decided I didn't want to be a goalkeeper anymore and wanted to be a striker like most kids do when they uh, start football. So I uh, changed positions and I went up front and then I had quite a good, quite a good um, sort of start as a striker. I was my club's top goal scorer in the under 13s, I believe it was. And that got me a bit of attention from other clubs and I ended up on Brentford's books. So I had a few, um, had a few trials at Brentford. Unfortunately, it didn't really work out because where my home is in Oxford, the uh, sort of travel to and from Brentford wasn't really suitable for my parents because it's, you need to be there three or four times a week. And it's just, 
not a viable option. Um, but between then, I had my first real setback in sport. So I was playing for my local Sunday league team, like Saturday league, Sunday league, under 13s, and it was the cup semi final. And we were four or five nil up with a probably less than three minutes to play. It was the very end of the game. And one of their centre backs on the opposing team uh, decided that um, he wanted to leave something on me in a challenge. And he went two foot into my left knee and broke my femur, tore my MCL and tore my meniscus. And that put me out of sport for about 14 months. And that was the real main setback in my football career. And it ended up spelling the end of it. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll come back to that. Like you mentioned, like you're a goalkeeper, very high level mm-hmm. at, at that age. And then you became a striker. You're obviously decent. Was it just natural, just like natural ability that you that you had? And was it a natural level of fitness at that age as well? Um, well, the natural ability, my dad was very, um, whenever I'd visit my dad, because my mum and dad are apart, he would be very like keen to, helped me practice and helped me train. And he always wanted me to do well at football. So I had kind of that drive from him from a very young age. And then my dad was always a talented athlete. Like he was in the military. So he was in the parachute regiment. So he's always had that base level of fitness. And then my mom's run five marathons and done like various like peak challenges. So she's always had that sort of underlying level of fitness as well so I've, I've got good genes in that regard okay okay all right so <clears throat> so uh coming back to this 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 injury that you got in football so that basically obviously put you out of football for, for a long long time mm-hmm. um i think and, and uh, presumably all sport as well around that time right yeah so the first knee injury that i've covered there it put me on crutches for three months so sort of six weeks non-weight bearing, six weeks like single leg weight bearing. And then it was a really long rehab process. So at first I was able to swim and then sort of cycle and then walk and then run and then eventually get back into football quite some time later. Okay. Is it something that still bothers you now, the injury? Um, it's very, It's a very specific sort of thing where any sort of lateral or rotational movement will is quite dangerous if like that's the right term that's probably the way it will reoccur if i get injured so i can do anything that's sort of straight like um running cycling all that sort of thing so thankfully high rocks there's not really any rotational movement like you have to go around corners but that's the only real thing so as long as i stick Stick to the straight and narrow, quite literally. Um, yeah. I'll be okay. One lap courses, please, as well, yeah? <laughs> Just a dead straight line. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, uh, so uh, was it was it after that that particular injury that like you suffered mentally as well with, 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 that, with that injury in particular? Yeah, so the first injury was the main real setback for my men's health. I was playing football six times a week for two separate teams, coaching another team, my sister's team, ironically. And it kind of put an end to all that very suddenly. And going from, I know a lot of people say it, football was kind of my outlet. It's what I live and breathe as a kid. And going from that, like encapsulating my life to nothing, um it made like it made life quite difficult for me and i always i always try to think positively like i'm in a i was in a fantastic situation like i'm privileged to be in the uk in oxford like i've got a roof over my head but it really made things quite difficult and then it was it was helped in the fact that i knew i'd recover and i've always had that innate sort of drive to get to my next goal and knowing that I would be back playing football kind of helped in some aspect but then after I'd recovered and after I'd got back to full physical fitness and started playing again within two months I had a reoccurring injury and then that's when the surgeon said we can operate again but like you 
you can't really play football. Otherwise, it would just continue to go on. And then it was quite a stark realisation that this sport that I'd put everything into for a decade nearly and that my parents and my like family put everything into me to try and succeed, I wasn't going to be able to do it. So, yeah, that was that was probably the the um, lowest point in my mental health in sort of depression terms. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that must have been that must have been horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, was it like was it was it that like you couldn't see any sport in future? Was it that like that, like you you just didn't have that goal to work towards no more? What was the what was the thing you were struggling with most? Was it? I think the, the main side of things was it. I think that was the main aspect. It was like sport had always been my outlet, and to not be able to do the sport that I loved kind of made things difficult. And then once I'd come to the realization that football wasn't going to be the thing, I came across cycling, and I love I love cycling as well. Like it was probably my second favorite sport after football, just because my um my stepdad was a very keen cyclist, and he'd always make me watch the Tour de France when I was younger. Um. So that became sort of my my new sort of thing to focus on and try and be the best I could could in that. Was that something that you could do as like part of the rehab as well? Is because yeah. it's yeah. like low impact, yeah. Yeah. So that became a key sort of thing, especially the second time round and rehab when I was told that football wasn't really going to be viable for me anymore. I was like, right, it's time to put my eggs in another basket and I chose cycling. So okay. that's when my cycling career kind of started. Okay, and what does uh what was cycling like? What 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 sort of distances are you talking? What what did that look like? Um, well, initially it was kind of just fun. So, well, my second knee surgery was twenty seventeen. So from twenty eighteen onwards, cycling became a bit of fun, and then I started getting into racing and taking it more and more seriously, and it was kind of an outlet for me because I'd still suffered mentally from not being able to play football and cycling became the only real thing that I could control and like like the thing that made me like truly happy because we all know like sports release endorphins and it's kind of and it's just an escape for most people so cycling became more of an escape for me as well um to kind of get myself out of my own head and whatnot mm-hmm, mm-hmm. did you miss the did you naturally take to like the individual side of the sport or like th- did you miss the team's team aspect of football um i think i enjoyed the individual aspect because mm-hmm. as an individual your the result is purely down to you it's what you put in, you'll get out. And I love team sports. Like I love, for instance, a high rocks. I love the doubles element. I love the relay element. But in an individual sport, what you do in training or what you do in preparation is what you get out of the race. So I think knowing that I had control of what I could do made made it quite like a an appealing sport for me. Okay. I can see that. So what I know you um I know like you've told me offline like you you struggled with like eating disorder around this time. Was this after the football injury when you were like going through a period of depression? Yeah. So I've kind of jumped back and forth a lot here. Um but once after my second injury I it was sort of year 11, my GCSEs that like stressful time of year for well, 14, 15 year olds. Looking back, it's not particularly stressful now, but back then it was a difficult time. And I felt very out of control of my life at that time. I'd just been told I can't play football. I've got all these exams. And when you're in that situation and you've got the depression and the stress, you try to find things that you can keep in your locus of control. And one of those things is what you eat, essentially. And it it 
spiraled downhill very quickly for me, especially considering cycling is quite an energy demanding sport. Like you need a lot of calories. And if you're not eating those calories, you're going to lose weight quite quickly. So from about May to August, maybe April to August in um, 2018, I lost about 20, 25 kilos wow. in body weight. Um, I went from sort of low 80s to at my lowest, about 57 kilos as a six foot, six foot 18 year old um, man, essentially. And it put a lot of stress on my family. And it's, it's I, I live life by like, don't have any regrets, but it's something that I wish I could have taken off of my family because I was in and out of hospital. We were going to like appointments five times a week, really. And it was difficult. And it's something that I don't think is talked about enough in men in particular. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of like girls and ladies that I know who have suffered with eating disorders come out and like are able to speak about it a bit better. But I don't really know other men who've been through it. And I think I'm kind of trying to break that stigma with like things like this. So it's something that needs to be talked about, really. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Did, <clears throat> did you not? Did you not feel like you could talk about it at the time? Like, presumably, your family noticed what was what was happening, right? Yeah. So initially, my family probably thought it was I was ill. Like maybe I had like a like a parasite infection in my stomach that meant I couldn't digest food or something like that and then my eating habits sort of changed and changed and I became like more fixated around food and that's when they really started to notice and that's when I started getting blood tests and the doctors were like you've you've got anorexia and it kind of when it hits you that you are suffering with that and that everyone knows you're now suffering with that. It's, it's a really difficult situation to be in. And there's not really many other ways to sort of escape like your head. It sounds very like confusing, but when you've got a, like a, well, an illness like anorexia, like your exercise and your eating becomes like just ingrained in your thoughts all the time. And yeah, it was, it was difficult really. I can imagine. Do you feel like if you look back now, is there anything like you wish you'd done differently? I mean, obviously it's easy to say like, like not, not go through that. Yeah. Like, was there, is, is there like, do you wish you'd reached out to someone that like, took a different approach to what you did um it's i'm i don't really come across as it in like everyday life but i'm quite philosophical and um in that regard and i think everything like everything that's happened in my life has led up to where i am now and where i am now is the best point in my life so far and it's something where although it caused a lot of stress to my family and whatnot they all were there for me and they've all seen me go through it and it's it's helped me develop as an individual i i and that's i know me like if i could have not gone through it i'd have not gone through it but i think everyone i know has made the best of the situation as um if that's if, that's the really the right way to put it but um no going through it i lost a lot of friendships on the way not from fallouts or like arguments just i didn't spend enough time with the people who mattered most to me in that time i was very housebound very like solo kind of not going out much distant. and yeah was, yeah distance perfect way to put it and I do regret that. And I'd say I don't live regrets, but that's 
something that even to this day, a lot of friends that I had, although they're still friends, we're nowhere near as close as I wish it could be because I just didn't spend like two years of my life with them essentially. And mm. like a key bit of development and yeah, it's not really much else to say there. Yeah. What, um, what got you out of this hole? Well, the whole period of my me suffering from disordered eating um, went on for just over three years. So oh. from 2018 onwards, it kind of affected me and I didn't really regain any weight. Like I didn't stop. I stopped losing weight and the um and like the hospitals were kind of happy that I put on a bit more weight and then stopped but as long as I wasn't losing it it wasn't really an issue anymore and from 2018 through to 2019 it still stuck with me and like a lot of the time I'd eat on my own and I wouldn't eat with my family and that I'd, like going out for dinner would be difficult for me mentally. Um, and then in 2020 COVID happened and I spent a lot more time, even more time on my own because we were all in lockdown and it still stuck with me through that, through that period of time. And then, even when I got offered a professional contract in France as a cyclist um, in 2021, it was still lingering with me then. And only when I came to university here in London, it really left me um, because I was in a completely different situation. Everyone here was new and everything was new around me. And it kind of, it kind of had a switch in my head and, um, like when I came that I need to change where I am. So on my 20th birthday, um, which was what three days after I moved in the 13th of September, I was like, my life needs to change. And I wrote down a list of 10 things I want to do in the next 10 years. And I was like, if I want to do these, my life has to change. And since then things have only gone better really. Okay. So it was really just like the, the catalyst, if you like, for the change was, was the the change of scenery, the change of situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just okay. All right. Awesome. What was on what was on that list of 10, 10 things you want to do? On my uh called the day. So it's the thirteenth of September two thousand thirty one. And I'm not gonna um I won't go through everything on it because there's quite a few things that I wanna let everyone know once they've happened. But um, I want to publish two books, um, one of which I'm midway through writing at the moment, um, and then sort of own a business as well. And there's a few sporting challenges, so I'd like to climb Kilimanjaro. That's one of the uh, things on the list, and complete an Ironman. Um, and then there's sort of have all my parents, all three of my parents retired, and uh, kind of give them a nice easy life after by that time really awesome what what will the books be about um so the first book i'm writing at the moment is called time and since since well i wrote this list i've kind of lived my life by four rules so rule one is three seconds um I won't bore you with all the details of it, but you count down from, if you're struggling to do something, whether that's get out of bed in the morning, talk to someone that you want to talk to, but you're kind of, you've got that thing in your head saying, oh no, you sh shouldn't talk to them. You count down from three, three, two, one, and you do it. You get out of bed, you go and talk to that person. Um, rule two is five minutes. So it's about sort of habit stacking. If you can do something in five minutes that you've been putting off, do it. Like that might be dusting a shelf or texting your grandmother that you haven't spoken to in two months. And if you 
stack 12 of them together in an hour you've done 12 things that you've got on your to-do list that needed doing and kind of you've got them out of the way and then the 30 minute rule is i um i posted on it about um on my instagram this weekend and i got a few questions from it um if something happens in your life like for instance if you have a bad race or someone makes you angry you set a timer for 30 minutes and you can be as sad angry depressed whatever about that thing for 30 minutes and obviously this is all within reason but then once that 30 minutes is over you can't change it and you just need to learn from it and move forward with your life and then rule four is 48 hours where you don't make any any big decisions you don't make them within 48 hours of hearing them because they'll all be emotionally charged so if you get an email from your boss that like infuriates you 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 let it settle in and then in 40 hours time you reply to it with a clear head and a clear mindset going into it and then Amazing. and then there's all other elements in that book like about embracing failure and then there's 60 lessons so there's sort of a famous quote from 60 different people that like we all as normal people can learn from whether that's like you want to become the most successful person in the world or you just want to make life a little bit easier on a daily basis it's sort of lessons that even if you only take three of the 60 away it will help you make your life and the life of those around you better and that's kind of what i've sort of aimed my life at doing since i went through all the struggles that i've been through it's kind of what can i do to improve the life of those around me and improve the life of the people who i don't even know but i know that the things i can do now whether that's talking about eating disorders or writing this book how that can help others pursue a better life wow love it okay awesome yeah. is that is so that's being written right now yeah yeah so i'm about i know like you don't really count words in a book but the document's got about 26,000 words so far um i was hoping to have it published by the end of this year because i've got a publisher who would like to publish it um but it's probably more of a 2025 thing now just with all the university work i've got going on as well <laughs> Right. What are you doing at uni? So I do sports broadcasting. So it's a very, very niche sort of degree. So there's only, in my year, 40 of us on our course. And the course is only available in three places in the country. So it's very, very niche. And ironically, the job I'm going into once I finish university is not really related to broadcasting at all it's more of a media role and sort of it will involve camera work and creating content and creating like creation of just content documents whatever but it's not really a broadcasting role but i think the skills i've learned in my time at university will like stand me in good stead going into it okay uh let's uh let's rewind and go back to the cycling a little bit yeah so you've you, you touched on it. You said you were doing it, and then you sort of mentioned uh, you had a pro contract. So presumably you got pretty good at the cycling, even yeah. while you were struggling with like the eating and everything like that. But you were mm -hmm. still performing, managing to perform to a high level. Yeah, yeah. Although I was performing to a high level, um, but if I like so I didn't make it in the end as a cyclist. Like I, my mental health in France deteriorated, and I just wasn't of the caliber I needed to be. And I made the decision to stop. But I got to an incredible level. I got incredibly fit. Like I could hold at what sixty eight kilos. I could hold four hundred watts for twenty minutes, two hundred fifty watts for seven hours. Kind of wow. really like high power numbers. But if if I'd have not had my eating disorder, then I do believe I could have still been in the sport now and I could have 
been at a level where I'm like I'm getting paid a lot of money to race essentially. So I I was really good and I worked like my socks off to get into that position to be that good but I could have been better and that's the thing I look back on and think what if but I'm happy where I am now and at the end of the day the fitness I've got from cycling has allowed me to cross over into higher rocks and be at a level where I'm looking to push into the elite 15 come next season and I think it's only really benefited me the fitness that I got from that even though it didn't work out mm -hmm. what did I I don't really know too much about the cycling world so what did that look like you were you were performing in, in races like a team wanted mm -hmm. to take you on professionally so you went and lived over in France for a while doing that did you yeah, so I raced for a team called Ucube um, Decept. Well, that's a probably quite poor pronunciation. Um, and they're a domestic team in France. So because I was relatively inexperienced, they like kind of hired me, well, signed me on a sort of a risk. Um, it wasn't like amazing pay. Like my house, they like paid for that, supplied all that my like nutrition, my bike, everything else, travel. And then I had a wage on top of that. Um, but it was probably the worst time to go over because it was 2021 and there were still lockdowns. Like you're in, in lockdown, out of lockdown, in lockdown, out of lockdown. So in my seven months over there um, racing, I only really completed in seven or eight races and I didn't really get any results of note and um, there was one major crash that I had in a race out there where I broke my collarbone and uh, broke my elbow and that kind of after that it kind of hit me that maybe maybe I wasn't going to make it okay all right so <laughs> when when was this when did you like leave that team um, so I left France late May 2021 and then I okay. spent three or four months at home. So I continued cycling a lot because I was hoping that maybe a British team would pick me up or another team would see me, but that never materialized. And then it was like, I'm going to go to uni because I wasn't intending on going to uni in 2020, but I got offered that contract and it was kind of like I've got to, I've got to give it a go at least um and I very reluctantly decided to go to uni like I was very much against going at first but looking back it was the best thing that's happened to me um like that whole leaving France and then coming to London like really turned my life around really it's like I don't really like to say that it saved my life because I, I wasn't I wasn't dying or anything, but it did save my life in terms of happiness and where I like feel fulfilled. So I think that's that's probably the biggest thing I got from it. So when did you when did you discover High Rocks? And and then also sort of like were you were you running around this time as well, or was all the fitness from cycling? Well, so um, I came to uni September 2021 and then I stopped cycling and I got into not CrossFit, but like functional stuff, which is what High Rocks is, but without knowing what High Rocks was. So I was doing a lot of ski erg, row erg, sort of that kind of thing. And then I got into running from that. Um, and what, in New Year's Eve 2021, I was like, oh, I'll I'll just do a 5K. Like I was running probably 20K a week for the two months and I'd kept a lot of my fitness from cycling and I did a 15, 51, 5K. And a lot of people were like, you should probably try and like see what you can do like in a marathon or something because you've got all that fitness. So then I did a marathon after that um, for charity around Wembley Stadium. So I did 43 laps of the stadium. 
<laughs> and um, I did it in 257. So I did that in February 2022 to raise money for the brain tumor charity because that's the um, illness one of my friends was suffering with. Um, so I raised fifteen hundred pounds for that, and that was kind of that was kind of my one experience in a marathon block. And then was that was that on your own? You ran that? Or was that an official? Yeah, no, just just... on my own. Just woke up and was like, <laughs> "Yeah, we'll do it." Um, and then after that, I found High Rocks, and I'm very much like, if I want to do something, I'll like I'll do it properly. And I was like, I need to kind of put on some size, like. It's all well and good being massively aerobically fit, but if you can't push a sled, then you're not going to win the race. So I spent the best part of a year, really, trying to get as like big and strong as possible. And then I did my first High Rocks in um, November 2022 at London XL. And I, I missed your question. I, um, I discovered it through Mark Lewis. Right. Like one of his YouTube videos came up on my YouTube and I was like, I've never heard of this guy and I've never heard of High Rocks. I clicked on it and I was like, oh, I'd be, I'd be good at that. And then, um, yeah, found it from there. What was your, what was your time in that first race? Uh, so first race, my time was 108 plus a three minute penalty because I did the farmer's carry before the row, uh, which looking back was quite a rookie mistake. <laughs> um but yeah so my first time there was one well 112 or 111 if you add the penalty on and that got me fourth in my age group and i was like oh wow this is like i did okay but no like since then to get fourth in my age group you probably have to run a 103 so it's crazy how much the sport has grown from what 18 months essentially yeah 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 uh and, and like your time has improved a lot since then what what have you what have you improved on? Because you're obviously already a good runner going into that mm-hmm. into that race. Anyway, is it is it still the running that's improved? Is it not just pacing the event, experience of the event? It's it's pacing and sort of strength wise. Like I've kept my aerobic like base and like aerobic fitness really high. Like since I started. So for instance, most events I win or come like top two or top three in the row and the ski just because I've got such a high aerobic capacity. And because now I'm a lot bigger, you don't like need to like running. You have to move your body weight, but those you're, you're not weight bearing. So it's more the strength that I need to focus on, like the wall balls, the lunges and whatnot, but I'm getting a lot better now. And my training the last three months hasn't really been, as like as optimized as I'd hoped it's kind of had to go down to 10 to 12 hours a week just because of work and university commitments so a lot of my training's done at sort of half five six a.m in the morning because I'm busy from 9 a.m till midnight a lot of the a lot of the week so I'm hoping that from today onwards really my life's a lot quieter um so I can put more time into training and getting better and hopefully fingers crossed run a sub 60 in the pro in London is the aim you say from today onwards is that because like your uni work is changing from from now on? um well there's a lot less face-to-face time at university I've got three weeks left and then it's done like right. um all I've got to do now is finish my dissertation I've sort of got everything else out of the way and then I'm starting my new job sort of part-time at the moment, which means I'll be able to leave um, my job at the arena quite soon. But um, but I love my job at the Wembley Arena and I love the people I work with, but the hours just aren't really compatible with trying to be a high-performing athlete. So once I've sort of left there, I'll be able to train more, recover better and put a lot more focus into like everything else really are you still uh are you still doing much cycling at the moment as part of your training for high rocks yeah so i use um obviously as a heavier athlete i'm what 88 kilos at the moment running's 
and with my dodgy knee, <laughs> running's not really the best. Um, as in, like, it'll break my body down quicker. So I use cycling a lot as cross training. So, for instance, my session this morning it's Monday after the two hyroxes. So I just had an hour and a half on the bike, just easy aerobic sort of ticking over, and I found it so useful. It's so useful to clock up more and more training hours without necessarily causing too much fatigue. So I think that's the that's one thing that I recommend a lot of people try and incorporate in a lot more. I've got a uh, I've got a foot issue at the moment. I've not run for three weeks. So I've I've been on the Ooh. concept two bike for uh, the last three weeks, and this yeah, yeah. It's, it's been a lifesaver to be fair. But um, I'm telling myself. I'm interested in your opinion. I'm telling myself it's going to carry over well to to not just like the the running and the fitness, but also things like like sled push. I think it potentially could help on that, mm-hmm. and and maybe even the lunges. Like, do you, do you feel like you perform particularly well on those because of like the, the cycling and the leg strength and the leg endurance, or am I kidding myself? <laughs> well, it's um, well, it's the classic answer. It depends. So. If you do a lot of low cadence work, that will help improve your leg strength. Um, but the main benefits you'll really see, like I'm quite into my science and like anatomy and whatnot, is a lot more capillarization in your legs from cycling. If you're mm-hmm. able to just turn over for hours and hours, you get more blood vessels in your legs. And the more blood vessels you have, the more blood you can take around. And the better you're like, well, the more efficient your body is at clearing out toxins. So it will help you in that respect where you produce lactic acid when you're pushing a sled and then all that extra blood volume you can move about your legs. I mean, you can take it out quicker. So the beauty of Hyrox is whatever you do, like whatever exercise you do, you're going to be benefiting a station or a run in some aspect. Like if you do a shoulder press, you're going to benefit your wall walls if you lunge. You're going to benefit your lunges, but you're also going to benefit your sled push because you're working on quad strength or your wall walls because you're working on quad strength. It's um, the crossover between any sport will help in Hyrox. And I think that's the beauty of it. Like that's why we see people come from triathlon backgrounds or powerlifting backgrounds, or whatever, and get into Hyrox. It's like, it's, it's the, I know it's kind of their, their um motto, but, it is like the most encompassing fitness race you can do. Yeah. Yeah. What were you like in a, in an ideal world when you haven't got like uni commitments and everything like that, what would your, you sort of mentioned your 88 kilograms. So your body breaks down a little bit more with the running, like what sort of running volume would you do in an ideal week for you? Um. Well, I've got my training. I'll kind of, I'll get up here now. I've got my training for the next two months up until world champs mapped out and I will see an increase in running volume. So I think here I've got it down as 71 kilometers this week and then 80 the week after 80 the week after that. So bumping up the running volume, but then a lot of it will still be easy, but then when it gets to more intense like phases, I'll do. I'll keep the volume the same, if not drop it, and just replace the easy runs with easy bikes, just to enhance the recovery. But yeah, I'd say about eighty k a week is probably the sweet spot for me. Any more, and it's kind of sort of you're not really getting as much return for the effort you're putting in. But any less, and you, you're still leaving gains on the table. Still a decent chunk. Yeah. Um, are you are you coaching yourself, writing your own programs? Yeah, so I've coached myself like the um the whole time I've been an athlete, really. So I write all my own sessions, I write all my own programs, and then I like to experiment. So if a session goes really well for me, then I can recommend it to people and whatnot because like I'm getting like a few coaching and um, PT courses done at the moment once I've got all the uni out of the way, and then I can actually start helping educate people officially um because but i know i know a fair bit now from all the years i've been doing stuff and i'd like to kind of help people out with that Mm -hmm. okay in a in a race when a race is getting tough and 
uh, you're exhausted. Where where does your mind go? Um, I'll either sing the songs, not actually sing them, but word them, um, like mime them with my mouth, or um, there's quite a few photos of me doing this. I'll look up and count the beams on the uh, roof of the uh, arena. <laughs> So a lot of the photos you see of me running, my head's tilted backwards. And it, I probably shouldn't do it because it probably like closes your airways or something. But I count the beams on the ceiling. Obviously, I look in front of me and make sure I just don't just like run straight into someone. <laughs> Plowing people down while you can't beam, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the best way that I've taken my mind off of it. And then... So it's like I a always... distraction technique, like both the singing and the counting is, is distracting from the pain that you're in, is it? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, yeah, essentially, and it just takes my mind off of things. And then I kind of think about sort of it's very um I answered it on one of my it came up on like a I did a question thing on Instagram yesterday and it came up and it sounds very like sad and whatnot, but um that friend that had the brain tumor um that I did the marathon for, he died fourth of April two thousand and twenty two. So it was like his two-year anniversary, what, a few days ago. And he was a massive Chelsea fan, like a season ticket holder for like 40 years, I think it was. So I always run with blue tape on my right wrist. So there's a lot of photos of me with tape on my right wrist. And it kind of, a lot of, so he was, well, he was 50s when he died because he was quite a close family friend. And I'd spend all, the, all of my time like in the afternoon with him when I came home from school and a lot of the sort of things I've learned in life came from him that he was kind of like a dad to me so I when I'm running and it's hurting and I look at my wrist I'm like good like I don't want to say I'm doing it for him but like I think of him and like he'd love to see what I'm doing now and it's kind of that's one of the things that drives me forward as emotional as it is it's kind of another distraction technique Wow. Okay. Um, we we sort of touched on Copenhagen a few weeks mm-hmm. ago. Was it the second fastest men's pro double time ever? Yeah. So Jake, um, Jake Williamson, the guy I did it with, he was meant to be doing the men's pro, um, but he didn't want to do it so close to Cologne because uh, he's trying to get into the Elite 15 with the last chance qualifiers. And we were always... Because we've since Vienna, um, we've been like we've spent so much time together. Because we're like, well, when I'm done with uni, I'm going to be working with him because we're the two two first people at the new company. Um, so we were like, oh, we should do a doubles together if we're going to be working together and training together and spending all this time together. And it was like, oh, should we just do pro doubles in Copenhagen? There's tickets available, and I was like, yeah, sure. So literally on a week's notice. Um, I did Copenhagen with him. I was really ill the week before, which was a bit bit of a nightmare. Um, and yeah, we ran a 51-51. I got cramped halfway around, which kind of slowed us down a bit. But we were like, we looked at the screen when we did it and we were like, we've just run the second fastest pro time ever, like pro doubles. So I think that's probably one of the highlights of my Hyrox career, Yeah, Copenhagen yeah. race. I was going to ask you that, what your highlights were, but... Um... I saw I saw some of the live stream that someone was doing, and I saw you had cramp around the burpees. It was around the burpees, wasn't yeah. it? And I must admit, I thought at the time then I thought, oh, like they're not going to do that faster time now. He's obviously mm. like, fully struggling, and then you popped up with a fifty-one, which is incredible. Um, yeah, there's there's that video or Instagram post of you like dying behind Jake on the road <laughs> <Yeah>. as well. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> was it was it like was it really was it was it was that like it's your best race in in high Rocks, but was it also the toughest do you think yeah like without doubt it's kind of because if it was a solo race and i cramped i would have probably like stopped to stretch or maybe even like pulled out but it was my first ever doubles and the element of like you're doing it for each other kind of is what got me through and I know that a lot of people were watching and a lot of people were interested and it's the worst cramp I've ever had like because we um 
we did the relay afterwards as well. So we finished our pro doubles and then I was the first leg of the relay 20 minutes later. And I was on the start line and I couldn't, I had to just not stop moving in the start pen for the relay because if I stopped, it would just cramp up again. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure if it was just because I said I was ill the week before. It was like a lack of electrolytes or whatever. But um, yeah, it was definitely the toughest race I've ever done. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> All right. What, what's what's your what's your plans for the rest of the season? Is it like you're working towards the world championships now? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll be doing the pro pro um not pro doubles, just the men's pro in London in May on May the fourth, I think it yeah. is. Um, and then I want to do possibly Dansk um in Poland, the men's open there two weeks before Worlds is kind of a tune-up race because I feel the open like I do a lot of open races because I feel they're really good training um and just to see where I'm at um and then worlds in what nine weeks now yeah and hope hopefully hopefully I can get a top three in the age group because there's I think the under 24 age group is amazing at the moment in the fact that there's eight of us or seven or eight of us who are all so close, like ability wise. And like, you genuinely can't tell who's going to win. Like in Vienna, when we did the European champs, there was four of us sort of within 20 seconds of each other for the whole race. Um, both Yannick Hoffman and Yannick Jappler from um, Germany. And then, oh, Spanish athlete. I can't remember his name. But I know, I know him. I've just his name's just like gone from my head. But we were all so close, and it's going to be like an incredible race in Nice. So I can't, yeah. I can't wait for it. I think some of them age, like it's like, obviously they 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 film the the elite fifteens and that. But mm-hmm. I think some of them age group races are, are, are so oh. close and so like I know in my age group, like the standard has become crazy, and like the racing is so close that it's it's almost a shame that they can't film everything. But you know, it's just yeah, practicalities. Um. Thank you, thank you for this. It's uh, thank you for sharing everything you've shared. Like you say, I think is is important. Um, an amazing story, and you're only 22. Um, so so thank you for for, for everything. Um, if people want to follow you, find out more about you, what you're doing, where should they go? Uh, yeah. So the main probably main place to get in touch with me is my on Instagram. So it's Charlie underscore E F M B. So they're my uh, they're my initials, um, and then like if you want to DM me, I'm always happy to chat about high rocks. Or if you're like struggling with anything, like I'm an open book and like I'm sort of an anonymous person that you can just chat to about life, really. And I'm always happy to help. So that's probably the best place to get in contact with me. Awesome. All right. One one question I'll finish on. I don't always ask this, mm-hmm. but. Um... <laughs> If you could put a message out to the world on a billboard for all the world to see, what would it say? Oof. I'm I'm a sucker for like quotes. So I'd probably I'd probably do something inspirational because I love an inspirational quote. So it'd probably be um life is not about the pursuit of happiness but the happiness of pursuit or life It's in the second ones in my Instagram bio, um, a quote from Marcus Aurelius, uh, um, a Roman emperor or a Roman Caesar, um, which is life itself is, but what you deem it. So you can, you'll get given a bad, like a bad hand, a bad set of cards, like bad luck. And it's kind of how you as an individual face that challenge. That's kind of what life is. Probably butchered that like definition, but they're yeah, probably no, the good. two they're probably the two things I'd put on a billboard. Awesome. Or just right. smile. Or just smile more. Just like <laughs> smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right, love it. Well, thank you. This has been brilliant. Um, really appreciate it. Anything else I should have asked before we finish up? No, I think we've covered everything. It's just like keep doing what you're doing because I love, like, I love the content you guys put out, and 
I'll see everyone at the next race, I guess. All right, perfect. All right. Well, good luck for the rest of the season. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Greg. Good night.